Chapter 15 of Piano and Song by Friedrich Wieck, read by Alan 1405. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15 Conclusion I have received the following communication from an old literary friend to whom I sent my eighth chapter, requesting his opinion of it. Motto. There are unreceptive times, but that which is eternal outlives all times. John von Muller. My dear friend, I have read your eighth chapter. What you facetiously call the three trifles seem to me to be the three most important points, even if you had described them simply as fine taste, deep feeling, and a good ear. Who expects superlative excellence from the age in which he lives, and who dares to attack it in its most vulnerable parts? You grow more harsh and disagreeable, and you do not seem to consider how many enemies you make, among those who think that they have long ago advanced beyond these three points. Just now, too, when there is so much said about the intellectual music, and about the inner nature of the future, and when such fine expressions are invented about it, you come forward with your three unseasonable trifles in the superlative degree. Do you imagine that our intelligent age cannot discern your hidden satire? You say that our times are in need of your three trifles, and the necessary knowledge and experience. Voila, too! As for Prince Louis Ferdinand, Dusek, Clementi, Himmel, Hummel, C.M.V. Weber, Beethoven, etc., who has not heard all about them? After them comes the period of piano fury, and the compositions appropriate for it. Now the three trifles required are distorted taste, hypocritical feeling, and a depraved ear combined with the necessary superficiality and some power of production. Voila, too. After that, musicians bethink themselves once more of the genuine three trifles and return to reason, and we are allowed to take delight in Chopin, Mendelssohn, Franz Schubert, Robert Schumann, and a few others of the same sort, and again in Beethoven. These were succeeded by mere dry imitators. They were not, however, of much significance. Finally, the very latest progress introduces a still more extravagant piano fury. The three trifles are now distorted taste, no feeling, and no ear for tone. And with these are required the necessary audacity, immeasurable vanity, senseless exhibitions of strength, a poor touch upon the piano, and what they call intellect. The compositions are now embellished with appropriate pictures on the cover and with attractive title pages. In addition, there is much talk about a higher beauty, the standpoints which have been already surmounted, artistic flights, and the misunderstanding of the inner consciousness. Genius must be free, etc. My old conservative friend, you are seen through. Your influence, and more especially your ideas about singing, belong only to a past age. They date from the last century. You will be derided with your Jenny Lind and Henrietta Sontag, they are lifeless images of singers to be kept in a glass case. Are you willing to remain ignorant of the magnificent modern style of voice? Can you not go forward with the advancing age? Progressive philosophers will wrap you over the knuckles. You imagine that our times will stop for a couple of lectures. You will yet have to learn what intellect signifies. In short, I should not like to stand in your shoes. You should conclude your book with Pater Pachavi. Even in misfortune, your sympathizing friend, V. E. End of chapter 15. End of Piano and Song by Friedrich Wieck.